George Bruno with the 21 Report, the European edition. We are in Warsaw, Poland, and I'm talking with Richard Grannon. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Wow, what a talk. I was in there taking notes, and I got some of those notes here. We're going to (laughs) talk about those things. Where do you get the insight from that you teach? It's powerful. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky in that in that regard. I think um, there's a there's a natural tendency towards certain things, and um, I'm I, I'm lucky in that I can take a concept, a problem, and a situation, and I seem to be able to just go, oh, that's like this. Oh, that's like this. That's like this. It's probably like a manifestation of ADHD in some yeah. sense. But um, and when it comes to issues related to psychology. I can see clearly. I mean, if you ask me about finance or mathematics, there would be a very different response, I can assure yes. you. But if it's if it's my thing, if it's psychology, it just pops up in my head. I can say, oh, there it is. That's quite yeah. clear. That's yeah. quite clear to me. But yeah, that's, I'm lucky, very lucky. Oh, wow. Uh, it, you know, I, I can only talk about a couple things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is so much content there on stage. Give us the... Um, just the short version of what you talked about. The short version is um, I'm focused on a concept at the moment that came from my work where I work with people who've been in abusive relationships, bad divorces, bad relationship bus stops. And usually they're, they're people who've been with abusive personality types, narcissists, psychopaths, and so on. And they develop a tendency in the way that they respond to relationships and the way they respond to life. Mm-hmm. And um, this is typically called codependency. Yes. And what a lot of people in abusive relationships do is they sit in them knowing it's bad, hoping it will get better, mm. even though it can't. And Hoping isn't a strategy, is it? Yeah, not really, no. <laughs> and even when they're presented, normally intelligent people are presented with tons of evidence to the contrary, like it's not going to get better, and they still just keep on hoping. Mm-hmm. So I started to look at the concept of becoming toxically passive, like toxic passivity. Toxic passivity. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Describe that. How how would you... I never heard anyone say that. How would you define that? I would define it by inviting people to look first at how we're living now. I mean, where our culture, so-called culture, is up to now. It is the embodiment of a toxic kind of passivity. Mm. We're watching ourselves... And we're watching life slip by and literally, not figuratively, we watch it on phones. We watch ourselves on social media. It's not affecting us as much, but I think for younger people coming up who are digital natives, they're born with a smartphone in their hand. My personal theory is it's actually splitting the ego. So the the very fundamentals of the human personality is now splitting. So there's the real me and then there's the online me. Wow. Wow. So we would think, well, the online you is not as important. The online wow. you is the real important one. You know, I saw a cartoon. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was like Bizarro World or one of these mm-hmm. interesting, funny cartoons. And it showed uh, like if the Titanic sank today mm-hmm. and had all the survivors, you know, like mm-hmm. in their little life vests floating mm-hmm. in the water, holding up yeah. cameras, yeah. watching the Titanic yeah. sink. Yeah, yeah. Like live casting it to their Instagram. Oh my God, hashtag lol, can't believe this is happening. Freezing to death, hashtag hypothermia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they would. I'm, sure, I'm 100% sure that there would be many people who would do it. And that's the first instinct. Yes. It's worse the younger you are because of neuroplasticity, you're more open to it. But we're, just as, we're, we're susceptible to using the technology. It won't, I don't think it'll split our egos the way it does for them. But the technology is so well crafted to make you that way. It's such yes. a brilliant conditioning tool. Yes. Built by the world's experts. It's had billions of dollars thrown thrown into it just to get people to that state that, you know, we're all susceptible to it. But that's toxic passivity. I'm no longer in the driving seat of my life. I'm watching it happen. Problem comes up with with women, with men, with finance, with life, whatever. We process in this toxically passive way. And we mm. pretend that we're not in the driving seat that it's not it's like a story that we're that we're watching rather than living firsthand and that's really sad people have lost the ability to live firsthand you said something uh 
regarding the manosphere, which is a word I I swear every day that I'm never going to use that word, but <laughs> it's awful, isn't it? Isn't it horrible? It's horrible. I just <laughs> I don't I don't like that I, that glossary of words. I'm really trying to get away from it. Yeah. But you said it's not alpha or beta. Mm. It's not about being blue pill or red pill. Mm -hmm. It's more being an adult mm. or a child mm -hmm. as a man. Yes. Explain that. The I think because the, it's called the manosphere, so that's like in response to the womanosphere, I suppose. And it's a, res it's a reaction. It's a response to an ideology that has been putting women first irresponsibly, um, unfairly, and in a totally unjustified way. So yeah. the, this is, it's a response to that. So naturally it creates a dichotomy. We live in an era of just rampant with dichotomies, but it's a false dichotomy. Yes. It's not man versus versus women. It's not black versus white or left versus right. All of this is, is, is garbage. It's a total distraction. Really the challenge that we face as human beings is child versus adult. The social media, the culture we live in, it wants to keep us infantilized, consumers obsessed with the material world so that we keep buying products and they can keep harvesting taxes because love is free and the best things in life really are free. Mm -hmm. Being intimate with somebody, mm -hmm. loving somebody, they mm. can't tax that. Mm. So, so in a very real sense, love is the enemy of the agenda. It's 100% the enemy because mm. if you're with a beautiful girl and you're spending time with her and you feel good and you're fulfilled, you don't need to buy all the stuff that I want you to buy. You don't need to pay me taxes. You can just be. Yes. You can just be and you can just be content. And that that sucks for me. So I need to stop that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes... Uh, they want to keep us consuming and not mm -hmm. producing or creating. Right. 100%. You did so, touch on that, being just a... Consume, consume. Yes. I was, wasn't uh, what was the movie with uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper? Uh, they, they live. They live. Yeah. And one of the signs, when you put on those glasses, mm -hmm. you would see a sign that that would say consume. Yes. Yeah. And that's we live in. I mean, that's a long time ago. That's the eighties. We live in a much more hostile, uh, weaponized version of that today. Yes. Much more, much more ferocious, and it is. It's there, it's consumerist, uh, materialistic, it's individualistic, it's hyper-competitive. And these are, they've, they've infantilized us. We now think like children and live like children yes. because it's all about trinkets. It's mm -hmm. all about beads and shiny things. Mm -hmm. And we've lost, we've lost ourselves. And worse, we've lost each other. We've lost the ability to connect with other human beings. And then you have this rising tide of mental health issues and anxiety and depression. People go, well, why is this happening? And I'm like, what do you think? We need each other. And if we're, not only are we ignoring each other by being stuck in the phones and stuck in our own narcissistic story, we're splitting from each other. Everything is a division. Everything is a tribe. You know, uh, you're in that group. I'm in this group. So um, when you said you didn't like the, the, the name, the manosphere, one of the things that I want to make sure uh, happens because it's growing, it's developing, it's maturing. And I think the 21 Convention is a good example of a, a maturing open source system. Yeah. It's, it's philosophically very grounded, is that we don't feed into that false dichotomy. It's mm -hmm. not about men versus women. Mm -hmm. It's for men and a space for them to move forward, to grow and develop. And where we see a problem or a fight that needs to be uh, fought, um, this is this is how we're doing it. So it's not men versus women. It's infantilized consumer versus responsible adult. Mm. So maybe we should rename it the adultosphere or like something. That. You know, I like that. It's a little clumsier, but yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's a statement from your talk: We have never loathed ourselves more. We have really gone against the grain of nature. Um, it is not, not in our nature, I believe, uh, though mass media would have us believe this, mass culture would have us believe this, to be narcissistic. It's not in our nature to be greedy. It's not actually within human nature um, to be obsessed with material things in that, in that way. 
there is a flaw in human nature. It's always been there. It's not a modern effect. The Greeks were talking about it. How will we deal with the flaws in human nature? Mm -hmm. And many, a, a lot of Greek philosophy that we take for granted now, the Judeo-Christian philosophy was rooted in Greek philosophy, said, don't become obsessed with pleasures of the flesh. Don't become obsessed with materialism. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a downer aesthetic who's like, hey, don't drink and don't have fun. Mm -hmm. But if that becomes a core value of life, what's life about? Just material things and the pleasures of the flesh, mm -hmm. you've, you've lost, and then you call that freedom, you're totally trapped. You're yeah. totally, it's the worst prison you can be in. You're a self-obsessed, narcissistic infant who you observe yourself in life acting in this way that's childish mm -hmm. and puerile and stupid. Yes, we have that. It's the weaker part of our nature. It's within us. But the higher parts of our nature are loving, they're giving, they're community focused, they, we feel good. Like you see somebody who needs help and you help them. And then the, uh, the serotonin and the endorphin system rewards you. You feel good f mm -hmm. uh, for that. Mm -hmm. That's better than a Facebook like, that's better than getting extra followers on Instagram. Yes. You saw a human in need and you helped them. That's, that's who we are, that's yes. what we are. This is all falsehood. I, your body of work draws on so many different disciplines. I mean, you're talking about Greek philosophers. Mm -hmm in one breath and you're talking about history in the next breath and the latest cutting edge technology. And that's what makes your work so interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Nobody is coming to save you. That <laughs> jumped out at me. I said, I got to write that down. <laughs> Elaborate on that. Um, I'm not, I'm not the first person uh, to say that it's an important element of our development therapeutically. Um, I ran across it years ago and I was particularly focused on childhood trauma at that time. And it was a piece of the puzzle in my own personal recovery. So I was like, well, it's not like I think anybody is coming to save me. And then I was like, well, hang on a second. If there was a Freudian psychoanalyst in the room, what would they say? So if you've been abandoned in childhood, it's not that you literally consciously think somebody is coming to save me, but you end up with the the, the emotional scars and the echo of that desire. Mm -hmm. I hope someone's coming soon. I hope everything's going to be okay because mummy or daddy mm -hmm. or an authority figure come back and do something for me. Mm -hmm. So it's a consciousness elevating tool to remind yourself, stop. You know, don't, as, mm -hmm. as the, the, the Nietzsche quote I gave, which was hope is in fact the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torment of man. If you sat around hoping you're not acting, and action is the only resolution. Now is the time not to be just sat there, oh, well, let's hope everything works out. Give up hope. It's not gonna work out okay. The boss is already tipping off the edge of the cliff. We see that in every area of society. We gotta do something. Mm -hmm. So stop hoping, start acting. Yeah, I've heard it said that you can think your way into depression or anxiety, but you have to act your way out mm -hmm. of it. 100%, yeah. 100%. So you did a workshop. I, I did. <laughs> How did that go? It, it, it went well. Um, the guys enjoyed it. We had a good time. We covered magic, tarot cards, the notion of free will, religion, economics. We, we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. We even got into some the guys were talking about martial arts and self-protection issues, which is some of my favorite subjects is, yeah. uh, is around martial arts. Um, so, yeah, it was good. We had a good time. Oh, a good it's time. so personal, too. I mean, yes. when you're up on stage and the bright lights are on you, you know, you can see guys maybe in the first two mm -hmm. rows, but you can't see anyone mm -hmm. there. But when you do a workshop, you're six yeah. feet from... 20 men. A hundred percent. And it's, it's, it is, for me, it's, it feels like martial arts training where when you're delivering a workshop, that's like doing a kata. You know exactly where you're going yeah. to start, where you're going to end. It's pre-written. I, I, I wrote it. But in a workshop, it's like sparring. You're playing with people. Yes. You know, somebody will say something and I'll, del I'll pretend I didn't hear them or I misinterpret what they're yes. saying. And then they'll go, that's not what I meant. I'm like, I know that's not what you meant. Yeah. I, I, it keeps the energy alive. Yeah, um, and it's it's that to me is uh, is really really good fun, and you can see what I like to see is um, the look in people's eyes where they ask me a question, I say something that they're not expecting, and they kind of go, oh, hmm. and you can see them thinking, and they're like, oh, I don't really know how to place that. Yeah, and I'm in my head. I'm hoping that I've given them something that they'll still be wrestling with in like a week's time or two yeah. weeks' time, rather than just give a pat answer. Yeah, I don't. I don't really think it's all that useful to go, oh, here's the pat answer. 
there was a guy, a young lad I was chatting to in there. I was like, I want you to philosophize for yourself. I want you to grow the muscle of asking the question and debating with your friends and thinking it through with yourself and following something through to a logical conclusion rather than just coming to me and asking for something. Because that, again, is back to toxic passivity. Yes. I want you active. Engage with the subject material. You know, fight, uh, spar, roll with it. Tell people they're wrong. You know, don't be disagreeable. Be polite as you're doing it. Enjoy the process. This is how it was always done. Historically, people would just sit and debate and discuss without getting upset, Mm -hmm. without calling each other names. There was a boundary format for doing it. I think Socrates came up with, uh, you know, the Socratic method was the best way of doing it. And people would find pleasure in it. Again, you can't really tax that. Maybe you have a couple of cigarettes, a couple of coffees or something, and maybe one little cup of wine, and you can go for three or four hours, and it feels good, but it makes you a better thinker. We can't really have that. We can't afford to have people being good yeah. thinkers and figuring things yeah. out for themselves because they might not do as they're told. Yeah. <laughs> what keeps men awake at night? What do you think? Generally speaking, in all of your work with men, workshops, conferences, Mm -hmm. what keeps, if you could sum it up? Mm. I think the, for men, um, there is a desire for some kind of structure. And when they don't have a strong uh, moral philosophy and confidence in their ability to resolve issues for themselves, I think that creates both depression because they don't feel good about themselves. So low lying depression and an anxiety. And I'm like, and so they can be pushed. And I think this is an ideological push into God, if only I had the answers, Mm -hmm. everything would be okay. And I could sleep. Whereas I would rather say, no, forget the answers. You want the strength and the skill to figure it out. And then you develop the confidence to go, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen. Whatever happens, everything's going to be okay. I'll figure it out. Whatever happens, I'll figure it out. And when Anthony's talking about the necessity for a patriarchy um, and for fathers to be present, I think that's what a good, benign, loving, present father gives a human Mm -hmm. being Mm -hmm. is just a sense of, everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You're okay, kid. You can figure it out. Whatever it is, you're going to figure it out. When that is withdrawn and that doesn't happen, there is this anxiety and this depression. So... Um, I think that's what keeps most men awake at night is the lack of confidence in their own ability to just handle problems. Mm. Yeah, they have to have a uh, a comfort level with not having all the answers. Exactly that. Exactly that. And that's where in my own uh, research and in, in coaching people and helping people, I'm coming back again and again to philosophy. That's what philosophy was for. That's how... We've protected ourselves always with our, it's your ability to reason and to think and to process. It's like we don't trust that anymore or we've lost interest in it or perhaps we would rather just be toxically passive and let some mummy or daddy figure just give it to us. Um, but yeah, it's a good, it feels good to be able to say, well, what's the question? Let's lay, let's lay it down here. I've done this. The confidence say, we've done this loads of times. Whatever the question is, somebody could bring it here now, lay it between us. Mm-hmm. You and I can talk for 15 minutes mm-hmm. and we'll have something. Yeah. Might not be perfect, Yeah, but something. And that, yeah. that feels good. Yeah. You're familiar with Jordan Peterson. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. is your take on what I would call the Jordan Peterson phenomenon? I would say the phenomenon and, and the, the, the stellar rise um, is a response to toxic passivity mm-hmm. um, because he offers something else. He offers, um, you know, he, well, he actually talks in terms openly of a moral philosophy. Um, and I think he's also encouraging people to have a philosophy of competition. So there's an appeal in that. And people say, oh, it's just young men online. It, it, it isn't. I've spoken to people in the, in the real world. There's many, many women um, uh, who are, you know, not, they're not young. They're not, stu- they're not university age college students who absolutely love him. So I think somebody's come along and seen that there's a deficiency and gone, no, okay, here's actually something that, that we can do. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Jordan, I understand the phenomena of how popular he's become from that point of view. 
And, you know, as a psychologist, I think he's, he's, uh, he's hugely insightful. But when he drifts into other topics, I'm like, I'm not sure you're qualified to talk about that, Mr. Yeah. Peterson. Not taking anything away from the guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You are an absolutely important voice in this men's community movement. Uh, you, you are so needed. Thank you. And watching you on stage as you're walking back and forth on stage and I'm watching all the heads. <laughs> I'm sitting way in the back and I'm watching everyone not taking their eyes off of you. Right. You have their undivided attention. Your voice is super important. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. How can our watchers find you? How can they explore more of what you do? I think I think the best way um, is to is to just go straight to YouTube. Uh, there's a Spartan Life Coach YouTube channel. There are other places where I am, but I think in order for people to know whether they're going to like my style, the particular yeah. flavor that I come with, um, that would be the best way uh, okay. to go. And uh, there's like thousands of hours of content on on the channel, yeah. uh, so they're more than welcome to go and have a look at that. It's been magnificent and it's great to get to know you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Sir. Cheers. Absolutely.